Hey everyone, it's me, Tiller. Today I'm bringing you a review of Tales of Arise. For those of you who don't know, Tales of Arise is the 17th entry in the Tales of series. These games work like Final Fantasy, you don't have to play the previous title to understand the latest one. This does hold true for most of the mainline games. There are a few sequels here and there. Bandai has definitely pulled out all the stops for this one, as it would appear to be their most ambitious title yet. Now to preface this review, I'm not what you would call a Tales fan. I've tried a lot of the older games, anything that was available on PC through non-emulation means, because I don't want to go out of the way to get an emulator and emulate other games and stuff like that. I've liked one game out of four that I've played, and I don't think I've played a single game that I've liked in the time that I fell back in love with JRPGs, aside from Vesperia. And I have to note, I did not like Vesperia. The game that I liked was Berseria, and it was a game that I played just barely before I fell in love with the JRPGs again. I still have my problems with the game, but ultimately, the point of this is just to illustrate that I don't think I can call myself a fan of the series if I've only liked one of the four games I've played. Anyways, as usual, this review is going to be divided into the rant, the rave, and since this is a story-heavy game, we will be going into spoilers in a spoiler section, so I will let you know when that comes. However, you don't need to worry just yet, as the video is divided into chapters, and you can clearly see that there will be chapters for the spoiler section. Anyways, so we're going to start with the rant, and then we're going to go into the rave, so let's go. Hey guys, it's me, Tiller. I make videos every week on assorted topics in gaming. I do reviews like this one you're watching now, and I live stream on Twitch at twitch.tv slash tillerbrick, link in the description if you want to check it out. I'd really appreciate it, but if you enjoy this video, I hope you consider liking the video, and if you want to see more videos like this, I hope you consider subscribing to the channel, and let me know in the comments what you think of Tales of Arise. So starting off with the rant, first off, the AI in this game is kind of not great. There aren't a lot of ways to fix it, at least by the player's hands. Um, you can stat buff characters a lot and things like that. But when you put certain characters on AI, they like to kill themselves, like Alfin um, has a very good habit of using Blazing Sword. You can turn that off, though, and it'll be fine. But anyways, there was also no like clear indication of what each tactic change does. So when I finally needed to change tactics, I wasn't sure if there was a single one that let me completely disengage from an enemy. But regardless, it wasn't a huge deal. And I do wish we had a level, like a level recommendation for quests. Some of these quests are optional boss fights, and I went in super underleveled. And then I would just die, and I'm like, oh, I just wasted all this time. And there's no easy way to back out of a boss fight. You have to go to the title screen and then load up a file, blah, 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 blah. If you didn't save before it, get fucked, you know? It's it's not a process I really enjoy, and I wish there was a at least an indicator. Sometimes your teammates will shout certain things when you're approaching certain mobs, stating that they are stronger than you. However, there is never a clear indication of how much stronger they are than you. There are times where Law would say the exact same thing, when an enemy is one level above me, and when an enemy is ten levels above me. Even the gigant enemies, I think that's how you pronounce it, which are much like Berseria's Code Red Demons, have the same indicator even when you're the same level as them. I'm not really against the 6 art system that they have in this game, or 12 later on, but I rarely use the jump button in combat, and I wouldn't have minded having an extra button to map arts too. I understand that this game is a lot more aerial, but... I felt like every character had a distinct launcher, and they never had me manually input a jump command, so it never felt necessary to have the jump button. And more often than not, it is not enemies in the air that you will have trouble hitting, it is enemies that are too small. Finally, I'd like to talk about the Ultimate Edition of the game. I know there's a lot of controversy around it, but I don't necessarily agree with it. The version that is the Ultimate Edition comes with extra goodies and some gameplay enhancements. I have this edition of the game, and grinding is mildly easier, about 20% more EXP. Um, 
I can imagine the early grind is much more painful for standard edition players, but really it's not a huge deal, and if you pace yourself properly, I don't see you being too underleveled. You might have to do a couple extra battles here and there. I don't find the costume DLC to be as intrusive as everyone claims it to be. People are just upset that they cannot get the costumes, and while I do understand that, I don't believe that we are in the visual age where changes to characters are always going to be free. Unfortunately, that is the narrative that the gaming industry and ourselves have kind of put up over the past few years, that when a microtransaction is cosmetic, it doesn't matter. It doesn't affect gameplay, and that is the something else that I can talk about in an entirely different video. I don't really want to get into it here, but regardless of that, let's move on a little bit. The thing I do find intrusive about this is that the game has a host of gameplay, like small gameplay things that are DLC. That's not okay. Don't lock gameplay elements such as skills behind DLC. Paying for levels, paying for extra money, that stuff I don't understand because it's a video game. Why wouldn't I want to play it? Like. It doesn't take that long to grind, like, one or two levels. It takes a decent amount of time, but if you know what you're doing, it shouldn't be that difficult. However, everything that I have to complain about is mostly small. The only thing- the only other thing I would talk about is that it feels like manual is a much less efficient way to play in this game, because of how much your attacks move you and how difficult it is to actually control what you're hitting when you're in manual, and semi-auto feels like the best way to play. However, that is very subjective, and I think some people may prefer manual at the end of the day, and that's fine. However, any character with range, or magic, or just a lot, of, or skills that make them move a lot, probably not a great choice for manual. Anyways, let's move on to the ring. So Tales of Rise is paced like a lot of JRPGs, and initially that might seem worrying, but the game basically ramps up, and it'll typically feel like you're zooming through plot points. In a good way. Collectibles are easy to find in this game, and there is a clear indication of where they are, and giving you the tracker relatively early is a nice touch so that you don't have to backtrack as much. I hate when games give you a tracker in the mid to late game and say, oh, go backtrack through all the areas to find shit, and all it is doing is padding out time. And it's a pain in the ass. Anyways, the combat is easy to understand, and a lack of a block button means learning to dodge is essential. This gives characters a different feel when you get introduced to a character who can actually guard. However, the guarding character cannot dodge. It's a good distinction to have, and I really enjoyed it. Visual design of each area is pretty nice, and none of them look exactly the same. They all have their own perks, and it makes it easy to distinguish where you are. The various recipes and hidden skits behind each recipe, or some recipes, help give me a reason to care about cooking, as I'm not someone who cares a lot about cooking in video games. Adding some party member interaction encourages players to care about side quests as well. When it comes down to it, the game is very well crafted to keep players interested in the content regardless of it being side content or main content. It's rare to find a game that has me this motivated to finish all of the content. And even the fishing is pretty fun, which for me is a rarity. The addition of boost attacks so that each party member has a purpose beyond just their battlefield presence in combat is a good idea, and it feels it feels right. It feels like a good way to incorporate the party when you can only have four members on the field. Boost strikes also feel good to execute, and they are quick finishers that don't slow the pace of battle. The game itself is beautiful and the soundtrack is great. The battle theme might wear a little thin towards the end of the game, as it never changes, but it wasn't a problem for me. And additionally, the English dub cast and the JP cast do fantastic jobs at bringing these characters to life. The casting choices fit their roles, and I think the directing is pretty solid. Bandai has hit the nail on action cutscenes as well. So much of this game is really good, and I'm happy to see Bandai pull off another solid title. Alright, here is your warning to skip ahead to the verdict if you are not interested in being spoiled. So... There should be sections or time codes in the description 
go down and click on that or click to the new section. It'll be about two sections ahead of this one. So with that in mind, I'm going to go ahead and start the spoiler rant and the spoiler rave. So please skip ahead if you don't want to get spoiled by anything because this will contain story and spoilers. So I want to talk about the I forgive you Volron scene. It's really fucking stupid. The Renis Alma's lying on the ground, Alfin wastes his time with some talk no jutsu bullshit, and instead of picking up the Renis Alma while Volron is laying there, he waits for Volron to hopefully come to understanding. It is the stupidest shit I've seen, because we know Volron has never been a character who gives a shit about that, because we've seen so little of him. Had we gotten some kind of sympathetic thread or something in his backstory, I would say it would be more interesting, but Volron is very clear on having a singular purpose, so, you know, it's stupid. Like, at the very least, have Alfin run for the Renesalma and grab it first, or fail to grab it, and then Volron just picks it up and goes like, and then explodes. Or at least have him continually clutch it. It There, there are a lot of ways you go about solving the scene, and it's really disappointing. It doesn't ruin the ending by any means, but it kind of feels like an ass pole because there's so much time for Alfin to grab the Renis Alma that's on the floor. Also, Voron's kind of fucked up, and I don't think I can find it in my heart to forgive someone like that. I, I don't think Alfin can really forgive him in the sense that he can't speak for the population of Ganeth Haros at all, but whatever. I'm also kind of sad that they didn't implement the other three Pillars of Light into the main story, but I guess that would be a little too much padding for three extra areas that seem to just fit as standard dungeons. I feel like Volron's entire plotline is a little wasted because we don't get any insight on the guy. He kind of just shows up wherever the fuck he wants to, and he just does things, kills things, and then goes away. Him showing up at the end was expected, but aside from the production value that went into that fight and how cool it is, I don't really care. I get it's the whole two successful sovereigns and stuff like that, but it wasn't something that I felt emotionally attached to, nor did I care about it. It's not like Velvet and Artorius in the in Tales of Berseria. I'm not saying everything has to be like that. It's fine that Volron's just evil for the sake of being evil, but... For him to be, like, kind of the last boss in this, like, epic showdown is kind of whatever. I don't really care about it. It's not a problem with the game itself. It's not a problem with the story itself. I just don't care about Volron that much. But at the end of the day, most of my complaints are not huge deals. They don't ruin the game for me in any way, shape, or form. It's just kind of hard to care about Vloron when he barely exists in the story. He's not even like a looming threat, he just kind of shows up, kills a few people here and there. I'm pretty sure he kills someone in almost every scene he shows up in. Which is kind of funny. Yeah, whatever. Anyways, moving on to the spoiler rave. So, I really love the stuff they put into this game. Like... Law punching Ganabelt in the face as he readies his, like, full power or whatever. The two openings, how the game is separated. The early per pacing versus the late pacing is great. And I initially felt lukewarm about this game as Rinwell kind of joins and then Law comes into the picture and it shifts to Law as the focus. And Doholim's trauma felt kind of weak the first time they showed it. I felt it felt, it felt very forced, I guess. But eventually they gave more detail to Rinwell and Dohalim, and it works out. It works out really well. Again, the pacing and the game's story structure are part of its strengths. The pacing near the first half is lightning fast. I felt like we were blazing through plot points really quickly. And then... Even like... And then in the second half, everything slows down and you get more focus into these characters. And even characters who got their focus arc in the first half continue to get developed in the second half, and I think that's a really good thing. Because a lot of JRPGs tend to be focused on a party dynamic, but they ultimately do not talk about 
or they don't they don't fully develop other characters after they've had them. They they, they develop them minorly, but I feel like here most of the characters got a pretty solid amount of development. And what's also important in this game that I want to touch on is how well crafted every area is. Glaglia is hot and dry. It's a region under full oppression, and after you free it, it still has the feeling of a developing nation throughout the rest of the game. Cislodia is a snowy wonderland, but everywhere you turn, there's a feeling of someone watching you. Whispers you can hear as you traverse the town, just giving off that unsettling feeling that you're told the town has, as you are always being watched. Benencia feels like a paradise, but underneath paradise, it always feels like there's something that's not right. And here is no different, but you're still not sure because everyone says they're so happy. And then, Mahagsar is a nation free of its oppressor, but even before Deadime did his whole thing, the destruction left in the revolution is an uncomfortable reminder of the sacrifices he was willing to make for the sake of freedom. Ganotheros is creepy as hell. And the citizens constantly chanting Volron's name, and their lack of free will is super, again, unsettling. It's amazing to see how well these areas are crafted and the atmosphere is created. It's just as amazing that they all feel and look super unique. Tales of Arise is a job done right and well by Bandai Namco. Every piece of it feels like the direction this series should be heading. It's not a perfect game, but it absolutely exceeded my expectations. I was definitely afraid that I might not like this game. And I hope whatever Bandai has planned next will be even better than I can possibly imagine. Here's the new Tales of Title for iOS and Android. Fuck.